Yes, please give me an Ino Miko episode. I would love that. She's sort of been sidelined into just awkward situations since she joined. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, I sort of don't blame her. But no, it's going to be good for her for just so many reasons. Once she can get over the misunderstandings, it's obvious that the Senpai are going to be great for her. And also, I feel like there's a lot there for her socially, right? Like, it was a short segment, but it was really touching, the fact that she's sort of looking to restore order into her life. She's kind of chasing this image of her parents without any real guidance or support, it seems. There's a real loneliness to her character. That's where the real value lies, as it often does. It's not in the specifics of the position or the, the job or whatever. It's just the fundamental human things that are hardwired into us. So many things just come down to the social. And it makes a lot of sense like beyond the obvious that we are people and we need other people to live and we're social animals you know other people serve as mirrors for ourselves and there are a lot of things you sort of have to see to understand that's one of the greatest things about being around others there's just an unfathomable amount of information to be exposed to and i feel like that works best at either of two extremes you know it's sort of obvious that you can get a lot out of people who are really high achieving and who are really great or have have really sort of transcendent traits what i think might be less obvious but equally useful is being around people that are sort of awful because at a very basic level it's something to avoid but actually i think at a, a more useful level or maybe more challenging level a lot of times i realize the things that i detest the most in others are things that exist in myself that i didn't know about yet and that while painful is really good to know and so in this situation you know sort of has both opportunities because she has so many gifts but also has a lot of opportunity for growth and so ishigami you close his eyes too it's because every time I walk into the office, it's filthy. It's not clean and orderly. Like, I like it. <laughs> and Miku Ino's spin off anime. That never happened. That never happened. This is a fanfic. Do not believe that this happened for Miku. Do not believe it. Wait, really? <laughs> Isn't this for getting a taste of her own medicine, though? This is an Inomiko fanfic, isn't it? Look at them on the same page for once, even if it is a fanfic. <laughs> yes, there's always hope in Chica. Place your faith. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> this is so dramatic. <laughs> this is amazing. I'm really lost as to like whether this is really what happened, albeit in a fictionalized manner, or if this is just entirely a fanfic that you know Miko is writing, that she's the easygoing one. Like, wasn't she the one who was demanding buzz cuts from everyone? Even if it was because buzz cuts make everyone cool and sexy. It's also sort of discoordinating to see them actually doing student council work. Because we're a season and a half in and all they've been doing so far is f***ing around. Playing fish cart and grab ass with each other, or grab hand or something. <laughs> Yeah, I guess Ino's not the only one who's going to benefit. Run, Inomiko. Run with all your might. That's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, why you gotta leave Ishigami out? This mini-episode is named after him. Yeah, this is what- this is the actual truth. Suddenly peanuts. That feels so right to me and I think it's a really great instinct because just thinking back to my own experiences, the things that were the most life-changing or turned out that way were often initially the things that I hated the most or had the most frequent thoughts about quitting initially. Things like working as a stockbroker. Even teaching initially was real, real pain that I hated every day. Just to take those two examples, being a stockbroker introduced me to a world of like real consequences and where people had no patience for frivolities or niceties. It was about show up and be effective and be reliable. And it was so fast paced, I feel like it, it whittled me out of a certain lingering childhood that I still had at that time in college, at least to a certain extent. And I guess similarly teaching was like that, but instead of high pressure stakes and a fast paced environment, it was more like being in front of people all the time. You know, teaching is essentially a public speaking gig, which is counter to my personality in, in many ways. And also the structure of it is, is counter to my personality. And so I feel like that helped me grow a lot. It's no coincidence. It makes total intuitive sense why the things that are gonna be the most beneficial are gonna be the biggest struggle at first. It's because it's something that you don't have yet. It's because it's something that threatens to decalcify the rigid sense of 
beliefs you've built around yourself as a protection of sorts, situations that don't allow you to rest on weaknesses are going to be the most painful, but also the best for that very reason. I think one of the biggest indicators of success is how well you can stomach discomfort and pain and work through it because the farther you can throw yourself into the deep end within reason and stomach the, the discomfort of being totally helpless or embarrassing yourself, the faster you're going to grow, the more you're going to learn and the more of a weapon you become. But you have to be able to put up with that, that discomfort, that pain. And so quitting is rarely the right instinct. There is, of course, exceptions to that. You know, there are things that are just terrible. But I have a feeling that most people, if really being self-honest, kind of know the difference between what's what. <laughs> oh, no, we're, we're surrounded by sex perverts. They're everywhere. <laughs> That's no fun. It's kind of striking that she has the lowest point to find for herself at this age. Yeah, this is an interesting side of her. Yeah, it's a pretty big misunderstanding. <laughs> Good place to start, as any. It's not a sex cult. Go figure. <laughs> This oddly feels like it's possible. <laughs> like, it feels like this is one potential future for them. It could go this way. It could. But is it much better? <laughs> oh my god, that's terrifying. Just crushing his leg. <laughs> Oh, what? Oh, no, oh no! Even as a, as a fantasy, this is bizarre. This is absolutely bizarre. Yes, all doubts, everything is clean and pure. There is no weirdness at all in this. From one extreme to the other. Though, why oh, do I feel like this is a little bit closer to the truth? That felt a little bit more believable to me than the Miyuki lust demon thing. I actually could see Kaguya and Miyuki ending up in that kind of relationship. It wouldn't be a huge shock. People who, for a long time, haven't been able to get what they want socially or, or romantically or love-wise through just common goodness and reciprocation can potentially get the message that it just can't be had that way, you know? And the way to get what you want is through strong-arming it, finding out people's weaknesses, using leverage. Because people are people and they need what they need and they're going to get it one way or the other. And if they can't find a good way to get it, then there are a lot of other darker roads to go down towards that goal. And Kaguya, I'm guessing largely because of her upbringing, hasn't really learned sort of the, the rules of the game, you know, or the fact that by letting go and being giving and trusting, you, you end up getting a lot more, hopefully, if you're with the right people. In fact, I think it's codified on the walls of her mansion. It's like people are tools to be used. You got to imagine that comes from her family and you got to imagine that's largely going to dictate the way they treat each other. So what other models? does she have she doesn't really know how to go down that path at all and the little she does know she's picked up from her peers but she's only going to get increasingly more frustrated with time and you can see her using leverage if it got to that point and Miyuki's kind enough that if he is not paying attention or doesn't value himself enough he could put himself in her hands in that way and I think once you start to make concessions down that road in terms of the power dynamic you start to sacrifice yourself to please other people and the other person likes that relationship and relies on it they're going to capitalize on it more and there's a momentum to those kinds of things. Not that I think at all that's what's going to happen. I think actually the truth is that this group is great for Kaguya and she's going to get what she needs out of it, which is the thing she's been missing so much from her family. Just saying that out of all the possible outcomes, that's more believable than the Miyuki sex freak one. <laughs> this also is a copy of a, a common song that has woo hoo in it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Confess your sins, of which there are admittedly many. He's my everything, he's my world, he's my salvation. He's my hope for living a somewhat decent life. Great job, Inomiko. You know, yeah, she lost that one. But also growth, you hope, right? Wow, this again. <laughs> this three millisecond bio. There it is, due to her loneliness. Yeah, this is sort of the key. She's unfazed by gossip or trends, and so thinking and evaluating using her own judgment. I think that's the thing I respect about her the most. This is actually a really great summary. She's a really well-conceived character, I think, because she's this great blend of, of desirable traits mixed with innocence and room for growth. 
Kaguya wants to touch. Okay, so it's not just me. There's a, this has been a turning point. This is very deliberate. Things are sort of coming to a head for her emotionally. We need another fireworks episode. I guess we're approaching the season two finale for that matter. A couple more episodes. Yeah, she's in a vulnerable place, right? She's in, in kind of deep now. But it's not a bad sign. It's just because of how potent it is to her at this point. At least she has eye. Imagine if she was isolated. I feel like that would just make things a thousand times worse. Maybe her, her main salvation is not Miyuki, but I come to think of it. Someone she can really trust unconditionally. And also someone who really has regard for her. Uh, like eating a tiny man who has a family, among other more, more normal things. Okay, it looks like we're, we're beginning to start getting there. We're almost starting to do something now. <laughs> Damn, what is... Ah, I kind of like this. Oh, she found it. She found it. Ooh, a motherly touch. Very interesting. I kind of want to, like, explore this a little bit and play with this. I feel like this could be really useful. The grounding, some physical action. I actually have no experience with this. The reason I have an intuitive sense that this could be really effective is because I have the reverse experience. In high school, I had a really terrible, really terrible, really prolonged breakup that kind of put me on my ass for a while. And I remember I had a lot of trouble sleeping at that time. I think before that period of time, I had a habit of resting on my back with my hands on my chest. But because of the amount of distress I was in at that time, my heart would beat uncontrollably while I was trying to sleep. And that would sort of create a cycle of more anxiety because I was aware of how fast my heart was beating, which called my attention more to the things I was trying to forget to fall asleep. And what's kind of crazy about that is that un until this day, I cannot be in that position. I cannot be lying down with my hands over my heart without it ar ar arising an enormous amount of anxiety, which is kind of fascinating that it went that deep. You know, that, that physical thing was wired that hard hardcore into my brain. I had never considered until right now that it could be used for productive purposes. That's something I got to think about. <laughs> I like that at least this is productive. I feel like there's significance to why the cheek touching specifically. That might be a little bit of a reach. Ooh. Yeah, but there's a difference between imagination and reality. Oh no, the hand grab. Oh no, we're in dangerous territory. Cheek touch. Cheek touch now. ASAP. Emergency technique. Special technique. Oh no. Oh no. It's been totally neutralized. The one time Yuki decides to be extra forward. Are we developing oxytocin now? Are we producing the sufficient oxytocin? <laughs> Speaking of desperation though, I feel like this is an interesting moment for Miyuki. It's sort of serving comedic purposes to interrupt her best laid plans of having this technique or schedule or whatever they call it. But he's really been stewing on this, huh? He's not doing so well himself. I guess I've been sort of unfair to Kaguya. You know, I've kind of painted her in this light that she's kind of losing it. And then Miyuki is somehow a little bit better settled with the whole thing. I still sort of feel that way, but it's possible that a lot of that, at least partly the result of just the fact that we see mostly through, through Kaguya's perspective. Things are kind of skewed in that direction. Miyuki very quick to blame himself. And he feels self-conscious about everything. <laughs> That's interesting incident where they were both deluded. Wow, look at this combo though. Unlimited power. She's at 1 HP. Does this give, give her critical damage? It does! Wow. Playing by Tekken Sex. Se Tekken Sex. Good job, Alex. It's because I watch this perverted sex club show every day. Tekken 6 rules with the critical damage. Also because she's a martial arts. Expert. And then she gets to touch her cheek. Speaking of him, I feel like there's a lot of development in store for him later. He's kind of been the quietest member. Kaguya doesn't refuse. Is this it? Is it ask and you shall receive immediately? Right into it. Just right all the way into it. 
with the development, that immediately resonates with me so strongly too. It's weird and painful in a kind of pathetic sort of way. When you realize that the things you hate the most, a lot of the time are very often the things you desire the most but don't know how to get. Like hating the popular kids. Popular kids get a lot of hate. And I feel like that's even depicted in movies where the popular kids are evil. But a lot of the time, the popular kids are like just the best kids. That's why they're popular. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's weird. Not to say at all that it's impossible to be both terrible and popular. But I think I mentioned this before, but in early high school, I had a really big grudge against people who drank alcohol. And that was based on a lot of misunderstandings and one of them was a misunderstanding about myself and not realizing that it was a world I felt I didn't have access to and that kind of made me resentful. What's sad about that too is I feel like a lot of times that situation ends up swinging back to the other extreme when you finally do get access to it and you hold it in higher regard than you should. You end up glorifying a world that you once resented, which is not a whole lot better. What a great insight from him though. Having figured that out already in high school. Look at this! Damn. A normie. It's a little bit of judgment in there, but progress. <laughs> Have we grown? Have we grown here? I don't know. No, oh, but this could be great. This could be so great. I would love to know <laughs> what that. <laughs> KFC translation is from what it was derived from. <laughs> I don't know, I kinda like these guys, they're having a good time. And they got better grades, they're just crushing it. Join them. Join them! You don't have to become them, but you can, you know, make an effort. At least. In today's society. I don't know. I don't know what this club does exactly. Huh? I don't know what, like, what it is. But it seems hella fun. <laughs> like, they're just having a great time, though. No? Never a dull moment in the cheer squad. It's just good energy. They seem friendly, too. Like, that girl went out of her way to approach the, the odd man out. That was a gesture. That was an extended hand, no? <laughs> yeah, they're just so awful with all the fun they're having. You could ask someone else in the club. They're all on the same page. Oh, this is not a flashback. This is happening live. I didn't realize that. Chica would give you her uniform. And she would say that. She also wouldn't judge you if you were doing weird stuff. She does have a soft spot for him, though, I feel. There's a running theme in this episode. It's the same thing as Inomiyuki being in this in this student council. This is probably exactly what he needs. And he has a great instinct that led him there. In fact, while it's not giving me the same levels of wholesomeness, there's something mob-like about that. Scrawny, quiet kid joining the body and brooming club full of bigger-than-life personalities. For that matter, there's also a fruits basket parallel, right? With Yuki joining the... I guess it's also the student council. Shinomiya-senpai. Oh no, he's becoming one of them. <laughs> I also don't know. The, what are the chances that someone doesn't walk in totally misunderstand what's going on? And here we go. And then... Iko Mino's innocent eyes. And just not even protest, just close the door. Nothing happened. It's good to see her having a good time. Interesting that her best moment, one of her best moments in a while, happens when Miyuki isn't around. What do they do? He's got that figure eight. Oh no. Oh no, why? Why did you do that? Okay, a little, sa little saving grace there. We have history with this line of inquiry though. <laughs> I see he went to the Demon Slayer Entertainment Arc School of Makeup. Oh, jealousy. You're not, I'm not jealous. You're jealous. There you go. You don't have to do it ultimately. And you don't have to like it. And you don't have to change your personality. But you might as well, you know, put your best foot forward while you're there. Is this going to be the tournament arc of <laughs> Kakuya? Oh, Yuki, huh? Yuki's just watching. Maybe that uh, spoof shoujo arc was 
A warning. Don't count out Ishigami yet. I mean, he's, he's out, but just for fun. Don't count him out yet. I like how both the opening skit and the ending skit kind of centered around the same idea where they're just so uncomfortable there. But you kind of get the feeling that that's exactly why they should be there. The reason they're uncomfortable and the reason they need to be there are the same. It's so much easier to just protect yourself from that kind of thing. It's so much easier to just rationalize why it's terrible and why these people are terrible and you never needed this in the first place and it wasn't what you thought it would be etc but it's just way more satisfying to see it through and how far one should see the things through is you know a subjective matter but i feel like there's a certain amount of self-honesty that's possible where you know where the line is between what actually is not good for you and what is just fear of something new and something challenging. I can't quite explain it, but when I quit things prematurely, I know it without knowing it. You know, there's a sense of guilt that kind of pervades me for a while after that. Like I kind of didn't get what I wanted out of that. You know, I didn't show up as the person I wanted to show up as in that situation and it's sort of soul crushing. When things are truly just bad and I walk away from them, I don't have that feeling. It, it just feels good to get away from it. And actually those two things would be possible for the same thing. Like I mentioned, uh, being a stockbroker, leaving it I think was the right decision. I, I actually felt a lot of relief leaving it because I think I'd already gotten what I needed out of it. To have stayed there longer would have been the opposite mistake. It would have been avoiding what, whatever was next, you know? But this is cool. I hope we get more Ishigami Yu and, you know, Miko for that matter in coming episodes because I feel like there's a lot that can be done with both characters. I mean, all characters, let's face it, except for Chika who's already, you know, a complete human being.